panel members, it's five o'clock. Uh, let's start our webinar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hello, good evening, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is fine. A uh, very short introduction about myself. My name is Mehna Mala, and I am here in Aritic. Uh, I'm a part of the marketing team and I have with uh, Mr. Ankit Prakash who is the principal founder of Easy Sendy and Aritic. Uh, he is also a tech entrepreneur for so many years. We also have Ms. Aparna Ranjan, uh, our, my colleague from marketing team. Uh, she will be the co-host with me in this webinar. Uh, hi everyone, good evening. So uh, really looking forward to this webinar and yeah, I think we, can, we are good to go. We can start. Yeah, so welcome to our second live webinar, Aritic uh, Live and we our topic is today, uh, use content to engage customers throughout the sales cycle. So coming to the Aritic, a short introduction about Aritic. Aritic is a unified marketing automation platform for the B2B business team. Uh, our parent company is Data Edge Software Private Limited, a Bangalore-based company which started operate from 2015 with two major SaaS product platform, uh, EasySendy and Aritic. So EasySendy is mainly focused on SME and SMB business and Aritic is mainly focused on customer from mid enterprise and enterprise. So we, uh, as in Aritic, uh, we are mainly focused on uh, 2000 plus companies across the globe but just recently in this year we started to get deep into the india and sa market Over to okay so heretic life uh, bringing professionals close to Eretic platform with Eretic Live and it is an online talk show organized for marketing, sales, business development, product leaders and working professionals. So the talk show include webinar, webcast, podcast and live event from Eretic and partner network. Now the topic, our topic for today is use content to engage customers throughout the sales cycle. As we all know that marketing is a powerful tool business which can be used to shorten the B2B sales cycle. According to the Harvard Business Review, on average B2B customers complete nearly 60% of a typical purchasing decision before speaking with a supplier. So we can tell that content is the tool that enables those conversations. In those words, we can tell that content attracts and draws and targeted prospect educates those prospects and helps prospects solve their problem and ultimately make a purchasing decision delivering valuable and relevant content makes that sales more relevant and valuable now i want to introduce our four esteemed speakers for today's topic our first esteemed speaker is uh, mr biraja swan who is like growth consultant from bs consult he is a dating, digital native Evangelist with over 30 global and domestic awards for innovative media work, a master's degree in marketing, and more than 18 plus decades of professional experience. He is currently working as a consultant with startups and media production companies. Before this, he built a global digital performance agency in stealth mode. He was the chief growth and innovative officer and Head of COE at Neo Ogilvy India. Before joining Ogilvy, he worked with creating the digital agency product for Omnicom Media Group in India and South Asia. He was also responsible for setting up the digital agency from scratch and growing mobile, search, social, and programmatic verticals within the agency. Today, Viraja is a well known organized. Uh, well-known members of the digital and advertising community in India and then also an act active contributor to the knowledge base of the industry. Besides being passionate about digital media, Viraja is a firm believer in the power of blockchain and green movement. He is also an avid blogger and lives with, in the heart of Bangalore with uh, his wife, son and golden retriever. Today, we at Aditic we got immense pleasure and proud to welcome Biraja to share his knowledge with us. 
Thank you, Mega Malak. Glad to be here. And hi, everyone again. Thank you, Viraja. Yeah. So uh, next, yeah, next speaker today with us is Vanishka Bhargava. She is founder of Contestify, a contest marketing agency for B two B SaaS uh, startups that works with startup and scale ups to help them establish a new scale and inbound engine. So uh, ah, welcome, Vanishka, ah, and uh, ah. we are very happy that you are here. You are here to share your view with us. You share your marketing experience with us. So if you want, uh, you can definitely uh, enlighten us with few of your words. Hi, thank you for actually giving me this opportunity. So, like you said, uh, Condensify is a fund marketing agency. We specialize in organic marketing for startups and scaleups. And uh, I was very happy to hear another person from Ogilvy uh, over here because I started my career there. They were the oh, ones who mentored me and got me into the field. So I went from being an engineer to an absolute organic marketer for SaaS products because uh, I worked on one of the analytics products of Ogilvy. So I'm going to be sharing some of the tips, everything that I've learned in almost a decade of my career now. Thank you, Vanishika. So our next speaker is Survi Kakkar, who is management consultant and also an independent brand strategist. So she is a seasoned brand communication and digital marketing professional holding over 12 years of experience in marketing strategy, execution, and content led transformation for both B2B and B2C brands. She has also worked across a wide range of industries spanning game, game in education technology and other sector. Survi has an excellent record in setting up things from scratch and leading and mentoring them. We are honored to have Survi with us and we are also request Survi to share some uh, point if I miss something from my side. Thank you, Leha. And uh, yes, you've very beautifully given the introduction, so thanks for that. Um, I have over 12 years of experience in brand strategy and cross-functional communications with thought leadership, content strategy for B2B and B2C brands being one of my uh, core competencies and uh, extremely excited to be a part of this discussion today. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Survi. So uh, next panelist with us is Vidyulata Prakash. She, she is a director of marketing for DocMation. Uh, Vidyulata is a strategic and data-driven marketing leader with an overall experience of 13 plus years. She brings proven experience in B2B SaaS marketing, digital marketing strategy, thought leadership, content, brand building, website, and social media, partner marketing, sales ena enablement, content creation, and communication. All started with a PGDM in marketing from Tier 1 Institute, IMT Ghaziabad. She has a penchant for writing that led to a master's degree in English. Deep understanding and inherent interest in the technology domain with a bachelor's degree in engineering. She is a Forrester certified B2B marketing pro. Rising CMO of the year 2021, awardee at the Women Influencer Summit for Outstanding Women in Tech and Harvard Leadership uh, Course graduate 2021. She is currently working as a director of marketing at DocMation. She is super excited to be working on a vast rebrand initiative as DocMation join forces with two other companies from the Salesforce uh, ecosystem. So uh, welcome Vidya Lata. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity where we can listen to you. So please enlighten us with uh, if anything you if I have missed out and you want to share. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction Aparna. Uh, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity, um, Ankit, and uh, the entire Aritic team. And um, uh, very excited to be talking about um, the significance of content in uh, today's uh, B2B selling landscape. And uh, lovely to be here with all of uh, the other esteemed panelists. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vidyalata. So uh, let's start our discussion round. So my first question to all of the panel members uh, according to you why does a proper content strategy need to engage the customers for the sales cycle Survi, uh, i will like to 
request you to start the discussion. Sure, Megha. So, my views on the topic mm -hmm. are like, for example, today a buyer mm -hmm. is halfway through their buying journey even before they make that first connect with the sales executive. And in the case of B2B buyers, they come with more information, uh, they often come with a set of preconceived notions and considering that they are already halfway through their buying journey before they actually make a connect with your organization. Content marketing, I believe, is the only way to meaningfully engage them before, you know, uh, while they're halfway through their journey. And you'll be surprised to know that in B2B organizations, they read up to 13 to 15 pieces of content before they will make that first connect. So before now, so that kind of content appetite already exists. And in a B2C environment where, you know, flash sales can often do the job, in a B2B environment, the whole buying process is more nuanced, more long-term, more drawn process. So content is the only way, I believe, which can engage the customers throughout the sales cycle. Thank you, Survi. Thank you, Survi, for such a expl nice explanation. I will request uh, Bidulata to enlighten us what you think about the question. Thank you, Megamala. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like um, Survi mentioned, um, studies indicate today's B2B buyers have, you know, already seen quite a few pieces of content before making a purchasing decision. And especially when it comes to B2B, right, it's not just one person making a decision. Uh, the typical buying group for any B2B solution is almost six to ten decision makers. And the process is usually long drawn and complicated. So showing up at a sales call with a generic PowerPoint deck and an outdated brochure, it just doesn't cut it anymore. So having a solid content strategy in place, you know, creating highly engaging, personalized content, uh, using a variety of formats across the sales cycle, that sets the sales team up for success, helping them to pitch, uh, land, and keep those customers. And, uh, you know, smart content basically helps get the right messaging via the right channel to the right customer and helps in communicating value and differentiation that ultimately leads to buy-in from the stakeholders that actually make the decision. And, you know, let's not forget the pandemic, right? It accelerated, uh, you know, a radical transformation within the B2B selling landscape where there were no in-person meetings. Um, so sales teams were literally scrambling to kind of make sure that the connections and the, uh, the connections that they had were secure and uh, their prospects understood that the sales team knew what their pain points were and how their solution would be the right uh, fit to solve those problems. In fact, Forrester says almost 76% of buyers, they choose vendors who can have an intelligent conversation and deliver effective value messages. So it's today, it's all about um, having a B2B content strategy that engages prospects across uh, the sales cycle every step of the way to build thought leadership, uh, credibility and trust because these are some of the attributes that ultimately lead to deal closure and revenue. Thank you. Thank you Vidyalata for such, such a nice explanation. I will like to request Banishika to uh, enlighten us with what she thought. So I think Vidyalada and Surbhi practically covered majority of the aspect from a consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. I'll take it from a business perspective hence. Um, come to think of it, the B2B landscape, right? It's not like you have one product for one use case, one purpose, one department. Uh, practically every one of us, whether you're a marketer or you're an HR professional, you have at least 10 products to choose from in the B2B landscape today. So it's actually no point having a huge feature list or a great pricing unless and until you can showcase the consumer, your end customer, how much of a value can you add. And that's when you they can picture themselves in a complete scenario, that's storytelling. And then content comes in because you can't quite tell a story through a feature list. Mm -hmm. So while, you know, from the consumer side, yes, you know, it's very important for us to consume information to make an informed purchase decision, especially when it comes to SaaS. I feel from a very business perspective, content marketing is now very important. 
to make yourself stand out because that's the only way you're going to connect with people in a very noisy domain where everybody is creating similar products so if you want to really associate with your target audience you need content to connect not just a sales pitch thank you thank you vanishika i would like to request mr swen to ex- enlighten us with the thought uh, i think you are in mute yeah i said the ladies have covered everything i will just add on you know a little bit of um, so i think we need to look at from the perspective of how complex the current b2b buying process is right so one big dimension that we normally discuss with clients is the time so typically lead cycle happens between 6 to 12 months which is a very very engrossed kind of time till the time somebody thinks of i want this i have this particular need till the time they finally come back and you know select a particular vendor or a partner to you know start working with them i think that time is one big dimension that we have to take in consideration because the only channel that can last that 12 months is content because the rest of the channels which are the paid channels will obviously will not be able to afford at one particular point of time will be expensive you cannot have an always on campaign apart from the search uh, you know platform that you would typically do typically you know that's also limiting so that's one big dimension the second dimension is the amount of people involved in the buying uh, decision making process right so there will be decision makers who are the cxos in a particular organization other people who take the call and then there will be the bunch of influencers around them which are the first year kind of people who would be end users most probably or people who would come back and recommend saying hey i think this is the you know the best of the lot or you know top 3 of the lot and we should consider right so i think the content is the only sort of net that can spread you know far and wide across a particular organization across lines of business across uh, different functions which can give you that slow burn and consistent touch across this 12 month kind of period and the complexity of the organizational structure together um, if we able to understand that then we will be able to go and fix the kind of uh, moments of truth as we call it on a particular piece of content which is very uh, unique for a finance guy for example we talks about cost and you know structure and and, and putting that and the same <coughs> software uh, feature of a different software could be appealing to the guy who is the end user who is sort of a developer sitting at the end of the day and and, and you know putting out uh, codes uh, every day day in day out right same software yeah. different uh, narratives different kind of audiences and across a time period i think i think we should look at a kind of a 3d kind of model if you put it in your mind but you know that's the way i think content is the only way you can achieve that there is no other channel which can give you that particular uh, level of uh, you know spare request a complex kind of organization thank you thank you viraja thank you for the nice explanation uh so my yes yeah, yeah so, uh, open up yeah so uh, there since we are talking about content strategy so there is one question that is coming up in my head so i thought i'll uh, put up right now so uh, what will be the proper content strategy that uh, can engage with the customer for sales cycle so uh, vidyalata if you can start with yeah uh thank you so much aparna yeah. so um you know before we get into what is the right content strategy we have to also look at uh how like how this came about so basically um the entire b2b buyer journey has changed and that is somewhere uh kind of impacted by um the constantly evolving b2c journey uh because buyers today they are most likely uh, millennials and gen z and these uh, people are more uh, accustomed to um, you know doing on their own research looking up online reviews and forming an opinion before even approaching the sales team versus uh, previous generations who relied more on analyst reports and rankings and uh, other forms of uh, research so um as a result in today in the b2b landscape um the the buyer has more control rather than the vendor or the seller and purchasing decisions are coming much later with lesser of an input from the vendors and it's uh basically even 74% of buyers already have uh, a lot of uh, research done before making uh, an on- offline purchase so knowing who you're selling to and carving out those buyer personas is extremely important as part of your content strategy you need to know who we are selling to and what are their specific needs and uh, the content strategy has to address uh, every need of uh, the the buyer at every stage of the sales cycle 
um, and this, um, as we have uh, the, you know, the buyer personas, uh, once they're done, then it's uh, more of a stage-based approach based on the sales cycle. Because um, uh, Forrester likes to call it the revenue engine, which is basically the sales, marketing and product teams. And these teams have the responsibility of working seamlessly and in tandem with each other in order to generate revenue. And these three teams need to come together to form the content strategy, which uh, will follow a stage-based approach like the sales cycle, where uh, we have content that is tailored specifically for the awareness phase, and then the consideration phase, and then the decision phase. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk about all the different types of content that uh, goes into exactly each of these phases. But this stage-based approach is a great way to address uh, content strategy, I believe. Yeah, very true. Thank you so much, Vidya Lata. Uh, Viraja, if you want to add something to it. You are on mute. So I will just add on to what Vidya Lata just said. Completely yeah. agree with her. I think funnel-based approach is something that is something that works um, yeah. uh, while you are putting content. Um, I have a bunch of two, three slides, which most probably I could just, you know, open and then, you know, show you the kind of framework that we follow at least um, for our set of clients. Um, Mega, would you just put that on? Yes, yes. So that basically will show you, you know, what is the kind of typical approach that we sort of have a mix in terms of what um, uh, Gudulata just mentioned. So we typically recommend a full funnel approach and as, as, as you heard, right, it's a very complex journey, right, across yeah. different touch points and different uh, kind of time frames that we're talking about. So there is a time when of uh, the customers are in a discovery mode. There are times when people are considering a particular shortlisted kind of pool of vendors and partners to actually work with. And finally, then the decision phase. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, so typically what we do, we follow a multi-content format. What I mean by multi-content format is that is a particular kind of content that we would put on the top of the funnel awareness kind of um, uh, um, uh, level. Second, at the consideration level, we will different, you know, use a different kind of content. And then, then finally, the final, the lead generation, you know, or the conversion kind of level, we will use different kind of content. These are some of the examples that are there. So there is a whole mix of diverse formats you have to use. There is no one size fits all kind of thing. The next slide, I've just illustrated a small example. So for example, if you look at the awareness kind of pool, we would use absolutely non-gated assets. So something where I will be giving it completely as free piece of content, I would give something as white papers or, you know, typically industry kind of analyst kind of reports um, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, the call to action would be learn how, discover or, you know, read more. And these are absolutely non-gated with, you know, the customer doesn't have to give any sort of information. The moment you go back into the consideration phase, there is a little bit more pointed information around the particular need and the kind of domain that the customer is actually looking at. So there you would most probably give him a little bit more kind of sort of in terms of, um, you know, given access to a webinar or give access to a little bit of gated assets in terms of case studies and slowly tell him, hey, this is some kind of value information and this is what you need to give and take. So you need to give me a little bit of information and show that you're interested so that I can, you know, um, there is a win-win in this particular situation. And then sort of the retargeting and everything happens and sort of a drip method of automation happens when we go back and slowly lead the customer into the purchase kind of funnel. And there the call to action is completely different. When we're coming back and saying, hey, take a free try or take a demo or schedule a demo and stuff like that. But over the funnel is basically like you are reeling in a fish, right? You have yeah. caught a fish and slowly you're slowly reeling in. But if you drag him too hard, then the fish actually escapes in the water. But here we are giving pieces of content, keeping them interested, keeping them engaged. And slowly as and steadily, we bring them down to the lower kind of gen funnel. And that's how we you know, mature the kind of lead. And, and that's typically how we use across the funnel different pieces of content and sort of marry them with a the kind of person. Mind you, again, the dimension is still there. The time dimension and the yeah. complexity of the organization dimension is still there. But this is sort of the framework that we could take forward. Yeah, completely agree with it. Definitely. Uh, Vanchika, if you want to add anything to it. Yes, I will probably answer the part of the question which said what's the perfect strategy right so uh, like the two of the panelists already mentioned you have to know your audience and then you need to follow a funnel sort of an approach and an ideal strategy actually also may depend on who your audience is and at what level of uh, the stage they are at what level of the funnel they are at there is a high chance that it's an already educated audience because hey, you could be possibly targeting data-driven CMOs who are already very comfortable using, let's say, an analytics dashboard. 
they know what it's meant for they know what they need they are very clear about those things so there's a high chance that you don't need to tell them what it is you actually need to show them how it works so you might have to start at the middle of the funnel so i would say a good strategy is one that follows the funnel approach as well as in depth customer personas because by now there's so much of content out there that most of your audience has already read the basics of it so there are number of times that i've seen a lot of businesses focusing a lot on top of the funnel which is like the awareness stage not realizing that we've probably exhausted most of the topics in our interest so when you throw Absolutely. the same thing at us is gone Correct. yeah so yeah. i would say marry the two things completely because you need to know what stage your customer is at by the time you start your content marketing efforts so that's a good strategy so just to add to what vanshika just just said you know that same value is very important so as you move down the funnel your content should have a little bit higher value than the previous uh, you know portion in the funnel right otherwise there is no point in giving that same content as you just mentioned right so whatever you're giving on the awareness kind of funnel you should have a little bit more pointed better kind of content uh, which is very applicable for that particular cmo or that particular middle level executive or that uh, junior level executive true uh, surbi if you want to add anything to it so um i completely agree with all of the other panelists but having said that i feel there is no one size fits all kind of a perfect content strategy because it will differ from organization to organization and industry to industry so and more importantly with today's changes in behaviors buying intents motivators preferences we need to be constantly evolving our content strategy so let's say we have a full funnel framework in place and we have identified and mapped our user personas to the kind of content we want to generate but if you are not constantly you know on top of optimizing that flow that we have we might run the risk of not engaging the customers across the cycle so that's very important i think optimizing our content strategy to make it as perfect as possible and second uh, while i agree with the full funnel approach and all i believe we should be very consistent so yes at every stage of the funnel your content should be adding higher value than what it was before but also needs to be consistent in terms of messaging at least at a campaign level so if a campaign has to pass through the stages of the funnel it should at least have consistent core messaging because we can't expect the audience to be you know differentiating our campaign from competitors and still remembering what we as an organization are saying if we are not consistent from a campaign perspective so those are the two thoughts i had correct correct thank you so much uh, everyone for sharing your point uh, definitely whatever points you have said it's very important and uh, we should we all marketers should take a note from it yeah over to you megmala uh so my next question to shurbi mr ms shurbi uh why and how do you plan thought leadership content for customer engagement okay and thanks for asking that because that's a very good question so um well i would say why i'll address the why part first okay so trust is the currency that we have in our post pandemic world and trust has taken a big hit and i think trust will be a strategic differentiator at least in the b2b buying process which is much more nuanced more long term and to enable that marketing roi through that process i think thought leadership content marketing is the only way to establish yourself or your brand as an authentic credible go to resource in your area of work and while we say thought leadership content as in you know content being the king in the domain of thought leadership the overall kingdom which is like how i like to call it the infrastructure which is comprising the audience intelligence gathering making sense of the insights that we've uh, gathered audience profiling and stakeholder mapping and finally content distribution also plays a key role in setting up that king's throne uh, now coming to the next part of your question like how do we plan a thought leadership yes. content strategy yeah pretty much starts like any other content strategy with a few differences in between so we typically start with assessing priorities for example what does your brand embody like what is your brand purpose what is your mission your vision and what does your brand basically want to speak to mm -hmm. and more importantly what sets you apart so there are obviously you know n number of brands out there selling similar kind of things so what sets you apart 
and here it is very important that we have organization wide buy in as in because these are strategic priorities your mission vision purpose these are strategic priorities yes. and having the stakeholder alignment is very important hmm. so get that organization wide buy in when you assess your priorities and set your priorities for a thought leadership strategy is very important uh um, the second step of the way once we have our priorities in place is about goals so for example what metrics do you want your thought leadership content to drive it could range from executive hiring to product awareness to brand engagement or anything else uh once you have your goals sorted we typically move down the funnel to identifying the channels which is our next logical step and depends on the collaterals that we'll be creating to meet those goals So yeah. collaterals could range from you know white papers to point of view papers that illustrate a thought leader's viewpoint on a particular trending topic. Those could be blogs, podcasts, videos, infographics, or any other. Depending on you know what are the goals we have in mind, what are the short term, long term goals we want to meet. Mm-hmm. A very important part of thought leadership strategy, I would say, which is not particularly a step, but okay. a step that kind of cuts across the framework, is to activate your ambassadors. ambassadors could be industry influencers they could be key decision makers they could mm. be even your own employees okay you know at the end of the day thought leadership is all about people and if you're not leveraging employee advocacy or ambassador advocacy you run the risk of you know not making your thought leadership content relatable so once you have that voice of the employee or voice of the influencer it instantly becomes much more relatable and uh lastly is there any other marketing strategy it's about optimizing uh, your thought leadership content strategy depending on what content format your audience is more to to what they're asking for so periodically assessing those motivators those intents is important to op- go back and optimize your strategy so yeah thank you shuvi thank you shuvi for such a nice explanation i will definitely implement this strategy as a digital marketer so over to you aparna yeah thank you thank you sudhi for uh, the detail uh, discussion that you gave us for thought leadership now uh, next point that uh, that is there i want to discuss nurture nurturing a prospect since imagine we have uh, gone through the funnel now when we are reaching the uh, like uh, the final stage after crossing all the marketing stage when the lead are at end of the sales pipeline what are the type of content we need to share to make them paying customers uh, vanchika if you can help me with understanding that so sure. so again uh, there is no one size fits all kind of an approach over here uh, okay. this is bottom of the funnel so bottom of the funnel content typically includes things like success stories case studies and sometimes even something which is uh it's not exactly a content format but it's clubbed with it it's personalized onboarding which includes you helping the person set it up along with content collaterals that will help them train their employees train the people who are going to use the product etc so i would say it's a complete mix of success stories case studies uh walking them through each of the features that kind of serve their objectives and goals at this stage it's very crucial to keep their interest hooked so you have to move everything around their objectives and goals so for instance if you're talking to a fashion and apparel brand uh you can't possibly show them a case study or a success story or a use case from the health and wellness industry because it's not going to associate with them instantly uh similarly if somebody is looking at let's say improving their customer engagement and you know you're trying to give them some tools for the same you can't talk about customer acquisition too proactively because as a lead who is at the final stage i want to put it in use right away so at this stage any content that helps me immediately put the product to use is what's really helpful is what's really going to convert so i would say yeah at the bottom of the funnel consider the person that you're talking to because uh by now you've probably moved across 6 to 11 uh decision makers right? right so now you know who you're talking to so you have a point of contact the person final person who's going to walk who you're going to walk through uh so i would say take that person's objectives challenges everything in consideration and then present the kind of content that would require that will give that final nudge you know for that conversion i would say correct correct 
definitely we this is what we should do because again in the end these people are deciding so we have to uh, make that emotional connect as well as in they should trust us mm-hmm. exactly and i feel yeah. that a lot of free to be products also offer free trials right so yeah. free trial to the paid conversion is usually a big hassle and what essentially happens is people start with a free trial because the product seems interesting but yeah. after the free trial is over they feel like okay you know maybe i can explore something else the loyalty aspect is not built so when they are in their free trial you need to ensure that you're giving them enough content which is educational again at this stage considering what funnel stage they are at um, so that they feel that it's of value to stick by you even after the free trial is over otherwise there going to be a gazillion products that they could sign up for exactly exactly vanishika i totally agree with you uh, coming to vidyalata i would like to ask you one question which i am curious of that what are the different types of b2b content that enable sales and how yeah thank you um, thank you meghamala for um, that question uh, i feel like it's it's very relevant in um in today's discussion and uh, you know like we discussed um today's buyers kind of control their journey through the buying cycle much more than the vendors are able to control the selling cycle so marketing um, as an organization has a much bigger piece of the lead to revenue cycle and um, we b2b marketers must take on that responsibility for engaging uh, with the customer throughout the cycle with different formats and different types of content so like i mentioned before if we are following the you know the stage based um a funnel so uh, uh, our first stage is uh, typically brand awareness um where we are trying to get out there and make sure that people know more about our brand what we offer who we are uh, as a company and uh, things like that so here um the the focus is on the content being a little bit more light and educational but also kind of focus more on topics relevant to the industry at large and not specifically at uh, at the product or what we're trying to sell uh, because otherwise it becomes like too much of a selling uh, in the beginning buyers are put off so some of the key types of content in this first stage would be um, blog posts for sure it's okay. always the number one form of content that performs extremely well if it's if it's written in the right format and and the length and you know considering all the factors that go into a great blog post and apart from that there are many other different types of content like uh the podcasts slide shows videos mm-hmm. um covering industry trends and uh, white papers and and short webinars uh tip sheets checklists you know how tos these are some of the things that will kind of position us as an expert in that field and what you know buyers want to speak to us because hey these guys know so much about this uh, you know i should at least talk to them that's that's the kind of um uh, response we want to elicit from uh, a prospect then Absolutely. as we uh, as the buyer proceeds through the funnel into more of um uh, stage 2 which is like an evaluation phase where they're researching and considering us uh, as well as our competitors and various other products um it's it's typically the middle of the funnel and then um here is where we have to kind of uh, talk more about our product rather than the industry and uh, we have to tell not only the advantages of having our product but also the disadvantages of not having it so we have to kind of give a 360 degree approach and uh, talk about the various features that we offer how it how is it solving their problem really what are the pain points that we are addressing and trying to solve and mm-hmm. of course if we have case studies from uh, customers specifically from the same industry that gives us credibility like anything so uh, this stage us for content like case studies and webinars that feature client success stories and uh, um, you know since they're already considering our product so we also have to throw in like roi calculators where they're able to kind of assess how does our 
uh, figure with respect to uh, other products that they're considering and then we also have to kind of say hey we, we, we are in this analyst reports we are we are in the got the magic quadrant and things like that so uh, these are some of the types of content that will kind of help move the needle in in our favor and uh, finally when it's this which is stage three mm-hmm. uh, and the bottom of the funnel um, the buyer has pretty much decided what they want um, or at least what we offer but they still have to figure out one uh, vendor with a list of other vendors so here uh, we're pretty much talking to c-level or decision makers the right stakeholders mm-hmm. so the content has to speak to them and it is more of uh, also like um, stuff that will help them yeah, make that decision and create an urgency and also help like the buying group justify their decision to the upper management and that will be like buyer guides and uh, very technical white papers um, implementation guides uh, targeted case studies with uh, with um, uh, you know ROI numbers uh, and video testimonials of how we were able to make a difference with respect to digital transformation and business outcomes so and detailed pricing information this is something Thing that comes at the bottom of the funnel but um, honestly the sale doesn't really end here because we also want to focus on after sale and making sure that we convert these customers into evangelists and uh, advocates for our brand so uh, we're looking at social referrals uh, specific events for customers uh, customer newsletters just to keep in touch and make sure that we're always top of mind for them Thank you, thank you Vidyalata, thank you for such nice explanation. Uh, okay, uh, so sorry for interrupting guys. Uh, just one um, uh, information I thought I'll uh, give you all. So there is a lot of question coming in our chat box. So I just want to tell everyone that uh, we have a Q&A round in the end. So we are going to answer all of your questions. So uh, you can just put all of your question in the chat. Thank you. Uh, so. Yeah. So next question, uh, I would like to ask Viraja. Okay, so uh, since uh, we are talking about content marketing, so I just want to understand what is the B2B content framework which is required to be implemented for a full funnel marketing approach? So uh, the presentation that you showed us in starting, there is uh, in chat, uh, there is this thing that they want to see it again. So if you can take us through the slide in little yeah, yeah, detail. absolutely, my pleasure. Just put up the slides again, I'll just take it through again. Uh, sure, I'll sure. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. So I think, so as I said again, keep two dimensions in your mind. One is the time approach and one is the complexity of the organization or the levels of hierarchy in the organization in terms of the maturity of, are you talking to your CX or your middle level executive or to a lower level end user, right? So that having been, so you, there are people who are in the discovery stage, there are people in the consideration stage and people in the decision buying, decision making stage, right? And people over a period of nine to 12 months, we have seen, they actually flip flop between the discovery and consideration stage, right? So there will be some content they will discover one particular point of time and that will excite them to go and, you know, delve a little bit more. But again, they will come back and, you know, try to search and say, is there somebody else who can give me that particular benefit or that particular, you know, a software or the tool or, or uh, a partner which can give me, um, you know, elevate my pain point, right? So. Yeah. And that's, that's typically happens. So there is no, there is, there is never a linear moment. The problem with that is that if you have one particular approach and you miss out on that particular person who is, you know, shifting back and fro, and at any given point of time between nine to 12 months, he's going to drop into your lead funnel. So, and that is why we come back and say, have an always on approach in your content and think long term and think uh, the larger picture uh, in terms of where you want to go um, with, with your campaign, right? If you go back to the second slide, and that's where the framework actually goes into. The framework is all about superimposing the content, the right content for the right persona that you're talking to. And this is, this is again, with the dimension of time and uh, the complexity of organization. So if you go back and talk to a CXO, you would come back and say, as I said earlier, you could go back and talk a piece which saves cost for the organization. And that appeals to that particular person because his job, primary job is to do that, right? If you go back and talk to the end user, he will come, come back and say, how easy it is for me to work with this particular uh, piece of code or this software and it makes my life easier. 
he will look at that particular point of angle and the cxo is properly looking from the business angle point of view saying how do i you know uh, save cost how do i make things easier how do i run my business more profitably right so yeah. definitely kind that that framework is typically tuned to that particular persona and then we use this bunch of formats and different different stages interplay with that along with that particular persona and as what manshika once mentioned right if you yeah. cannot go to a decision maker with one sir. level of data user and uh, you know give him something which is absolutely you know banal content right you will have to give him some kind of advanced content uh, he or she will be most probably uh, you know looking forward and find value in that so the value is a very key metric that we look at when we are you know creating thought leadership content or any sort of content that is going through the funnel uh, completely and finally when you go back and run campaigns on this particular content just to amplify you will see uh, in the third slide the kind of call to actions that we use the kind of ungated or gated assets that we typically use in the next slide up or no yeah uh, the gated and the ungated assets that we will typically use and then sort of it goes into the whole sort of marketing cycle and we what we call as a flywheel i think uh, should be mentioned earlier is that your whole organization has to be tuned to it the sales has to be tuned to it the delivery team has to be tuned to it the marketing team has to be tuned to it and you all need to have a buy in which goes into a flywheel kind of model and the content keeps circling you know throughout and gives benefits to all the three parts of the uh, you know um, the sales organizations together right and i think that's typically how we uh, you know create a framework and set it in motion and there are you know as and when we have different content calendars so there is a webinar calendar there is a a uh, blog posting calendar there is a different kind of thought leadership calendar uh, we also go back and talk to uh, ceos and cxos of a company and say what is your personal uh, you know outreach out like because a lot of people are swayed by the personal outreach for example anand mahindra on twitter is a you know is a person who comes out and puts out very serious content so that is a personality attached to it right when you think yeah. of mahindra and mahindra you will typically go back and relate back to him saying he's a trustworthy authentic kind of personality right so you know all those things comes together and in sort of did a um, um, proper framework and as i said there is no side fits all um, and we agree uh, as we all agreed as panelists here i'm not having to take any questions if there is on this uh thank you thank you so much beraja for explaining in detail everything i hope mr guha we were able to help you out with your query so yeah thank you so much beraja if it is yeah, certainly it's upon it's my pleasure it was uh, nicely explained by mr beraja uh, so yeah. so sebal i saw one more question i would like to take this opportunity to answer that so tactically you know how do you enrich uh, a sales person or enable a sales person i that was the question right So I'll give an example. What we do for one of our largest clients is a fintech client. Um, so typically, what happens is that we use very good pieces of content as the funnel, as the campaign going on. We use a tool called LinkedIn Sales Navigator. In the Navigator, there is something which is called uh, a, um, a document link, right? The Sales Navigator document link, which basically happens is you upload a document and it goes back. It gives gives out a link. We use that link on the campaign. When somebody comes back, clicks on that link as interested and goes and read it. The consumer doesn't know actually that you know what time they're spending is all recorded by the sales navigator. So we pass that intelligence in real time to the sales team, saying that hey, somebody is reading this particular piece of content. He's so and so CX of this particular organization, and when you have the next meeting with him, you could refer that to break the ice if you're having a cold call, right? Because somebody has referred to some kind of thought leadership content or any kind of content which might be a proof point or a case study of organization. So that becomes very crucial in terms of you know, intervention in the actual sales ground level and people are going and meeting clients on um, together. So we have found that very very powerful and we use that very tactically in our campaigns here and there. So so you know go and amplify and give that extra edge to our sales people uh, on the ground. Thank you, sir. and i would like to add to what veeraj has just said that you know um it so happens that over 50% of organizations say that after reading a thought leadership content piece they invite organizations to bid on projects you know kind of organizations that they were not even considering in the first place so once they read their view on thought leadership once they see their you know influencers so b2b thought leaders are nothing but your social media influencers who will have sticky following versus brands who will not have loyal team today's day and age so like veeraj gave the example of anand mahindra it, it's extremely important that you build that kind of authority to be able to you know get a foot in the door so 
Uh, yeah, excuse me. Uh, I have a question on this. Um, uh, Survi, you have explained it properly. Uh, regarding that influencer marketing and all, uh, what would you find the app process? Would you like to go with an uh, internal influencer like Mr. Biraja said, like CXO level uh, person like Anand Mahindra and all? Or rather we can uh, just focus on some external influencer or some brand advocates, which will be the best way to do it. So the best way I believe Saibal is to go for a mix of two. Okay, like I touched before upon this topic that having employee advocacy. So if you have somebody like an Anand Mahindra in your company and you know you would definitely want to leverage that kind of thought leadership that already exists. His kind of influence on decision making that already exists is obviously helpful. But if you're an organization that doesn't have that, you know, within your in-house capability, partnering with brand advocates and then creating a thought leadership persona is also a very good idea. I will just add on to what... Just just, to, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. Please, please. Yeah, so adding on to that, Saibal, um, I feel like um, that decision also is based on what industry you belong to because uh, for example like a cosmetics industry right so that works very differently from the technology industry so like cosmetics is completely relying on influencer marketing right now on platforms like instagram and it's not just one person who is doing all of that but there are multiple influencers who are just uh, making blogs and uh, showing what they do how the product works and things like how to's and all of that so that creates a, a level of trust with their followers uh, versus um, if in a technology industry that doesn't work where you need to have an author authoritative voice that's coming from uh, a place of experience of many many years and like the CXO level uh, experience which is where Anand Mahindra and those kind of industries work differently. Uh, thank you Vidyalata. I think Bidaja wants to add something as well. Yeah, I was, I was agreeing completely with Subhi. There has to be a mix of both. That is very critical for the B2B kind of um, fraternity that would be out. The only thing I wanted to um, add on to this is that um, when you when you sort of create a persona in your own company, right? Just take in effort the network effect that you do. And I'll and I'll again give a live example. So in a company, if there are around 10 to 15 VPs, right, and level who are VPs ever and stuff like that, right, in a mid-sized kind of company use them and i i remember should be talking about ambassadors right it's very very critical that their outreach also is very important on linkedin spaces or social media and stuff for the fact that they would have 50 500 followers so if you combine the 15 uh, you know people who have their own follower and the network of reach you will get a huge multiplier effect of just sharing one particular thought leader article on on their own feeds right i think that's something that we miss out i think that's something that is lying as a low-hanging fruit for every organization Nobody does it, right? You should, that should be sort of a game that is a hygiene for any kind of content marketing strategy where you use your own people who have a little bit of influence and authority in their in their own networks and sort of amplify that, you know, and people move change. I've seen, you know, some of my clients in Citibank will go back to Standard Charter. Some clients of Standard Charter will go back to, say, Access Bank. They will still have their own network influences who are their previous peers and stuff. So when the content circulates, they still get you those doors into RFPs and those doors into people who have not considered you at all completely, where you have not reached out together. So I think the network effect is very, very important. I think we should just use, you know, the people that we have internally as low-hanging fruits. And then obviously we have the analysts, the gardeners, or the foresters of the world, where we can actually co-create and create beautiful pieces of content, which are, you know, influencer-based content. But I think there's one more thing that we could add to this is uh, currently into the platforms available and the audiences that are available to everyone you can actually turn into your own influencer as well. Absolutely. Uh, you Absolutely. can identify the gaps, you know, that people are not talking about. They're hard questions that people don't want to answer because they feel that too higher up, uh, they shouldn't favor certain things, they shouldn't talk about certain things. So you could actually turn into your own influencer tapping into one, your interest, two, what you're really good at, three, what your uh, audience is really looking at and share content accordingly. So I feel that also builds a different level of authority, which is completely unique. I mean, we see uh, 
a lot of startup founders now focusing on the LinkedIn profile content is what we call it. It's essentially authority, authoritative content, right? So we're tapping into their expertise, what they want to talk about, and it could be of wider interest. So they're turning into those influencers for their own companies, I would say. Uh, we could probably even take the founder of Freshworks or we can take the founder of even WebEngage for that matter uh, as examples. Or if you want, we're looking at international ones, there's Dave from Privy who's doing a fantabulous job. So it's almost like what they say today becomes a quote for practically every other Absolutely. marketer out there. Yeah. So they're, they've turned into influencers themselves. So you could explore that as well. Okay, thank, thank you Vanishika for the explanation. So I am uh, personally curious about a uh, question, uh, like it's uh, like about the sales circle. So I'm going to ask one question. Uh, so the question is how, uh, what content we can use for or to increase the sales? Means what type of content we can use for uh, if we want to increase or like our sales cycle. It's Should I take that up? Yeah, I can, please take, I can take, please that take up. it up. It's, it's from a very recent uh, example uh, for an enterprise product that we were working with. And it's a social media analytics product. Everybody talks about using a social uh, scheduler or a social management tool, etc. cetera, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we wanted to position it as something that helps you keep up with what your audience is talking about. So it's social insights in real time. Now it was very harder to sell because we would say, hey, you know what, uh, you can like tap into conversations, you can understand the intent behind them. We tried every single angle. And eventually, here's what happened. When NFTs came into the marketing domain, we were the first ones to pick up on the trends in certain locations and what people were searching for. For mm -hmm. example, NFT in marketing had only a 50 search volume when we wrote about the entire piece in the beginning. So what we wrote because we were using our own product to you know kind of keep up with what our audience is talking about turned into a beautiful sales collateral right after because the moment the search intent picked up uh, we gated it after a while you know we gave up some information which was yes for free i mean we didn't ask for any information per se from the reader uh, but eventually we turned it into an ebook we turned some of the insights using our own tool into a report around nfts in marketing and then presented that as a gated resource so that in sales so rapidly we did we were seeing leads come in the ability to tap in real-time conversations actually helps you know kind of create content that's enabling sales so yeah i think that's that's one of the formats if you really want i would say that's the format tap into okay. real time trends and interests okay okay understood thank you vanishika uh, any of the other panel member wants to share something so uh, i believe vanishika has given a very very excellent example on, you know, how she used real-time conversations and then repurposed those into different content formats mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, generate sales value throughout, like for a sustained time period. But having said that, I don't think there is any one type of content, you know, that will help you to increase sales. It completely depends on which target audience you're using. And especially in the B2B buying process, it has to be more informative more useful kind of content rather than more promotional kind of content because at the end of the day it's not a b2c product that a consumer is going to use for a short time it's most likely going to be an enterprise product that's going to impact you know either the enterprise internally or externally like is it going to be an employee facing product or a customer facing product so having that usefulness portion of the content is very important rather than, you know, being salesy and promotional. Uh, so that's what I believe is the right strategy. Uh, so my very last question from my side, I am like a uh, little bit curious about this question as well. So the question is, uh, how is content marketing shaping up in Web3? Uh, any of you, you panel member can take up this question. You're asking about Web 3.0? Yes. I think it's very new days, if you can call it, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we are all crazy about NFTs and all everything, you know, metaverses, you know, people are doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, 
I know for example, if I exit, I put out a post on LinkedIn where uh, there is a 60,000 member uh, company uh, called EXP Reality in the US. They run their whole office on a metaverse. So okay. it is amazing. So all the meetings and the founder basically is saying, while going from meetings to meetings, I can bump into different people in the metaverse rather than going from one meeting room to other, right? In physical world. And mm -hmm. there are people, they have reduced that cost multiple fold. They have basically expanded the network across the US in a very large way. And these are all 60,000 people working in sort of a virtual campus and you know meeting people meeting uh, customers and if you log into that metaverse in five minutes there is somebody who's come back and greet you we'll take you to the lounge and say please have a seat i will get you the person who you want mm -hmm. and this is your meeting code and this is how you can enter a particular room right it's just fantastic right and these are all initial stages still you know and i think you know and this is pure content what we're interacting is basically real-time live streaming content right and anybody and content will leave an indelible ex you know image in your mind and what it basically does for EXP reality is just catapults them in terms of the positioning. That is one. Saying they are a forward-looking company. Second, they are they are look, they looked upon as a company which is in the you know in the first in the game that they're typically in. And third, they are giving a much better cost structure to their clients and customers because they have a reduced cost structure and you know uh, the way that they are operating right now. Higher profitability and they are listed in the New York Stock Exchange. The stock shares are uh, going high because of the big thing. So it's all like a snowball effect, right? And NFT, as we talked about, is a buzzword today, but I don't think NFT is like, you know, is, is, is something that NFT is just a database, right? It's just a ledger, if you can call it on a, on a blockchain, people are very excited about that. I think the main thing will come when we will have game engines built in like Unity and Unreal and sort of give you the ability to sort of create Pixar level content on the fly. Right? And this is content which is very, very immersive. So you could have a exact meeting with a CXO or somebody seated, you know, actually in real life in miles and miles away, but having a real time live conversation like we are having over a Zoom call right now. But this will be absolutely on a, a particular room and where we could, you know, you know, talk to each other. And these are not going to be the cartoon kind of avatars that you see today. There will be much more higher definition graphics uh, together. Um, and, and there is, um, you know, just give an example, you know, there are different implications into different industries. So imagine what will happen to healthcare. Imagine what will happen to sports and entertainment. Imagine what will happen to you know uh, technology kind of companies. So you could be in a place where content could be just you know uh, it could be a big bang of, of the kind of content that you will create and sort of run across. So it's just fascinating time. I think we don't have a uh, um, in depth of view of what we are getting into, but I'm sure it is exciting. I think I would add one more thing is that we're going to have to try and treat content more as collectibles. If you remember, there were these series of books uh, that we used to have. I think practically every household has these Harry Potter series books. Right? These are collectibles because that content was unique and appealing to that certain uh, you know audience segment as well. In Web3, there's yes, definitely, like uh, Piraj said, right? So there is a lot of content. And, but the content is going to become more intuitive, immersive, interactive in nature rather than the standardized blog posts that we have these days or probably the ebooks that we have these days. But other than that, we're going to have to start treating content as collectibles, which means that quality will come back again. Because honestly speaking, uh, yes, it's a whole new world altogether. Uh, we can choke it with more content, which is very bad as well. Uh, but at the same time, if you are looking at loyalty in Web3, you're going to have to treat it as valuable as a collectible because that's the only way that you are going to capture a digital market because they're your digital people now. You wouldn't have that kind of a, you know, connect with them. So I think, yes, a lot of content and creating content as collectibles instead. Um, just a small um, snippet of, you know, opinion on this would be that um, moving forward, you know, in Web 3.0 and all that, I think it's going to be more of, you know, since there's going to be a large uh, impact of AI, uh, it's going to be more of uh, user-driven content as in uh, we will get to know what people are actually, you know, people are asking for rather than just thinking, okay, this is uh, what we need at this cycle, this is what we'll produce and push it out versus we know exactly what people are asking for and then it's completely AI driven and it's, it's a totally different ball game altogether. Thank you all the panel members. Thank you for all this lovely discussion. Obviously, I have like learned a lot as a digital marketing professional. 
So, I would like to thank our uh, sponsor Niche Marketer as well. Uh, Niche Marketer is a community of credible and expert marketers in India. We, you all can have a look on the website. I will provide the website details in the chat box. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you so much panel members for this super engaging session. I'm sure everyone must have learned a lot and since we are running out of time that is why we are wrapping it up now. So uh, yeah, now I would like to add here there were uh, that we are organizing this webinar on weekly basis every Wednesday 5 p.m. for this month and even the upcoming month as well. So for next week we have planned on the uh, very crucial topic that is going on right now that is uh, digital digital analytics impact on a uh, business and marketing. So I'm providing the link here uh, and registration is open for that so you can go and register. Uh, if you're interested in uh, knowing more about digital analytics. Uh, we also have made a WhatsApp group where uh, we do give update about the webinar topic. If you're interested, you can join the group as well. So here is the link. I'll be providing it in our chat box. And uh, yeah, so we'll be we will be putting this webinar on our YouTube channel, Edit It. So do like, share and subscribe to our channel for the recorded version of the webinar. And lastly, so much guys. Yeah, Meghmala, you were yeah, lastly, I would like to tell Ankit to tell yeah. about something about the webinar. <laughs> Yep. So it's uh, the whole session has been really well well planned and well well thought up. I'm really thankful for you, uh, Megmala and Aparna, to design the session and all the speakers to make it really uh, seamless and and really uh, meet of uh, you know whole whole content meet today we have shared all the inside secrets of uh, content marketing uh, to be matched with the sales. And uh, this is where we could see a lot of uh, new changes coming up into uh, into web3 and metaverse and uh, yesterday i got an invite to you know uh, conduct our uh, our arctic live in metaverse so probably by next uh, by next month we will be conducting more of uh, metaverse metaverse webinars or metaverse events this is what we are up to and hope to see you guys uh, go together uh, need to go together into web3 and metaverse because the speed at which it is coming into the market it's a, it's a super super high speed because today's content we as human we are reading tomorrow's content not only humans but machines will also be reading so machines will be reading and then again bridging the content in front in front of the audience is probably reading a text-based content and then making a video directly and then putting up in front of the readers. So a lot of lot of innovations that we could see combining together as AI and ML and metaverse all are coming together into the market and this is where whole of experiences are, are coming into. So I mean we are going to go into really exciting times for the content and uh, we hope to see uh, really awesome sessions with you guys. So we'll be uh, really happy to come back with you guys to host more webinars on uh, Metaverse and Web3. And this this is all we have all about. Thank you, Ankit. Pleasure to yeah. be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. You other Thank, Thank you. Pleasure Thank, you Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the panelists. It was a wonderful session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hi. And Karna Kasa hai. Registration ko bol diya aur chat mein link nahi diya. De do, de diya. Thay nahi mere paas. Mere message kiya tumko. Mere paas. Mere dono pe. Internal chat pe. Abhi. Mere bol nahi pa. Ah, toh aaye. Chhoda kaise bhi. In sab ka mail hai diya. Sab ko mail kar diya. How was the session? Yeah, hi Ankit. Yeah, hi Meghila. Hi, Aparna is also here. Yeah, really good session guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Ankit.